Amen. So remain standing as we sing a couple more songs. <laughs>
Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. It is well with me. Bless the Lord, bless the Lord. Uh, just if you don't know somebody, get to know them. Oh, we already did that last time, didn't we? Um, Lord, uh, folks, I present this guy. <laughs> Sunday to lead, and this was uh, Randy's first Sunday to play the drum. So welcome, guys. Yeah. And... Uh, Walt's been here since uh, Jesus walked the earth. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, good to have you guys uh, helping us. And uh, this morning, we uh, have the privilege of doing something. I remember my very first time uh, to speak uh, at a church. And it was one of those first that you do in your life that you don't forget. And uh, every young person, pastor is looking for an opportunity to share. And so Sam, this morning, is to kind of share the word. He uh, is off at seminary studying, and uh, halfway through, he's got a couple more years. So I want you to pray for him. But uh, he is, I asked him while he was at school if he'd be interested in speaking this summer. He said, well, okay. And uh, so we have been working together, and he's going to share his testimony today. So would you give him a good hand as he comes? Good morning, church. I'm just making sure that I got everything in perfect order from the last service, so uh, bear with me just one moment here while I get going. Okay, I think I'm there. So I am honored and privileged to be able to speak here today, and that it, I'm just honored that Pastor Bruce would give me the opportunity to preach to you. Like he said, the last couple of years, I have been off at seminary in Texas, and I am transferring over to Kansas City, Missouri uh, this fall, so uh, I could definitely use your prayers um, in my quest and finishing up my seminary career. It has been challenging to learn and read the Bible in a way I've never studied the Bible before. However, the personal satisfaction I get from the training has been very rewarding. Today, I'd like to share a, a, a testimony that includes three personal crossroads. As I share in this testimony, I hope that you will see yourself in this journey. I was raised in a small town of Paradise, Montana, Anybody know where Paradise is? It's really pretty. Oh, yeah. Beautiful area. Uh, about a month ahead in their growing season. My, uh, my pastor was, was, a, was my uncle. He was a gifted preacher. He, uh, he was very good at uh, showing people that they needed forgiveness for sin. I was seven years old when I first came, went to the altar I, like many of you, you uh, who have been afraid of hell, was terrified of going to hell. My Aunt Karen prayed with me to receive, to accept Christ, and I thought it was over. 
I thought, okay, I'm, I'm in. I'm saved now. However, I was not secure in my salvation. My parents had divorced when I was, when I was a baby, and my mom, Roxy, was going, to be, was going to the University of Montana here in Missoula. I was going into the third grade when she, when she had accepted a position as a social worker in a little town in eastern Montana by the name of Colstrip. Does anybody know where Cold Strip is? Anybody been there? It's not like Missoula. A little more conservative. Uh, but it was here in this town that I became well acquainted with the person of Jesus Christ. My mom had found a great Bible-believing church with sound biblical teaching. I was enjoying going to church. The people were friendly in this small town. My mom married my stepdad with Jason when I was 11 years old, and, when I, and that was a blessing for my mother and I, as well as my sister. Also, I had, a little, I had gained a little brother in the process, and later on, a little sister. Uh, next next uh, slide, please. I was 12 years old when I became interested in angels. Like so many young people who are trying to find out what their purpose in life is, I wanted to know if God could be observed by the natural senses. We have all heard from secular scientists if something cannot be observed with the five senses, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling, then it's not real. I was also interested in how the natural world worked in order to fit in with many of the cool kids I knew. Anybody tried to do that before? Uh, yeah, fun process. My mother has been a huge impact in my spiritual walk. She wanted me to go to a vacation Bible school when I was 12 years old. How many of you have experienced the blessing of Bible school? Just one moment here. If you are a kid who has not gone to Bible school or, or vacation Bible school and you want to learn and grow spiritually, I highly encourage you taking that step of faith and going to a summer Bible camp. You will make memories that are unforgettable. Towards the end of the, the week, the Holy Spirit was working on my heart and I had the opportunity to speak to the, one of the pastors there at camp by the name of Adrian. It's amazing I can still remember his name. He had a deep impact on my life. He was my angel that the Lord had brought into me, brought to me for this one conversation that would change the trajectory of my life for an eternity. I was talking about angels and how I had never seen one with another boy at camp. The pastor had walked by and overheard a conversation in how I was doubting the existence of God. He stated, I need to talk to you. I remember thinking, okay, I can have an intellectual debate with someone who has a deep knowledge of God in the Bible. So, about an hour later, we begin our conversation. I cannot remember all the conversation, only the climax of the conversation. I told him that if I could only see an angel, that would be enough for me to believe in Christ. I'll never forget what he said. He asked me, wouldn't you rather see Jesus? I thought about this question for a good 20 to 30 seconds, contemplating the impact of saying no to such a profound question of seeing the only begotten Son of God. After about 30 seconds, I could not contain myself, and I said, yes. That simple acknowledgement of saying yes to Jesus was all it took. Isn't it amazing when you say yes to the right person, and all of a sudden, so many doors open? You never know exactly who it might be. It could be a homeless person. 
It could be somebody in the White House. It could be somebody at a local church. It could be somebody you meet at a meeting that you have no idea who they are, and then all of a sudden you say yes to them, and that's what they were looking for. That's the type of impact it had on my life. I can't, cannot fully explain what happened after I said yes. I can only say that I felt different. Even though I did not physically see our Lord Jesus in front of me, I felt his presence and felt a change going on in my soul. The fear of hell was gone and replaced with the love of Jesus. It wasn't... Can you, uh, next slide, please. It was, it was interesting to me how God worked. I physically wanted to see an angel, and instead he sends a person to help me understand the next step of faith. What does scripture say? James 4, 8. If you draw near to God, he will what? Yeah, he, yes, he will draw near to you. When I returned home from that week-long summer camp, Satan began to work on me. Like many of you junior high kids, I wanted to fit in, and cool secular kids don't do Bible studies. Has anybody noticed that? So I was facing a dilemma of trying to please man or walking with Jesus. When I was 13, my grandfather, Jim, passed away, and my grandmother, Catherine, was, need, was in need of someone to take care of her in Drummond, Montana. My mom had a, was asked to move from this wonderful place of Colstrip, where I had good friends and a great church, back to a place she had sent, spent part of her childhood in. I was going to move to a school that was much smaller, and the people of Drummond were much different than they were in Colstrip. I struggled at making good friends. It was a hard place. The kids did not like outsiders much. And I had, I had to learn to fit in. I was depressed. I told my parents that I could not take going to school in Drummond. I was not used to being an outcast. And so when I was 16, I moved to Idaho with my Aunt Treva and Uncle Nolan. I was so glad to be out of Drummond and get to be around my cousins whom I deeply loved. My cousin Bridger and I had a strange camaraderie. We always had some type of competition going on. It was a sweet time in my life. I began going to church in Athol, Idaho. And even though I knew I was saved, I wanted my family in Idaho to know. I was uncertain if they would believe my story of salvation of coming to Christ in Colstrip, so I accepted an altar call at the age of 16. My good brother in Christ, Roger, prayed with me again to accept the Lord. A year later, my parents had a falling out with my aunt and uncle, and I was back in Drummond. However, I was not going back to school in Drummond. Praise God. <laughs> I, was able, I was able to go to school in Deer Lodge. Deer Lodge was a nice school. It was bigger than Drummond, and the kids were much nicer to be around. During this time, I was not walking closely with the Lord. I was going to Drummond Community Church, and there had been a couple of pastors come and go in this tiny church. My parents were trying the ranch thing out and working full-time jobs. They were tired, but also they seemed full of energy. When my Grandpa Jim was alive, he was a big rope horse. He was big into rope horses. So he had, a, he had bred a few horses that were a lot of fun to train and ride. Do we have any horse lovers in the crowd today? They are a blessing, aren't they? My mom saw that I had a love for horses, and my grandfather and Uncle Jim Jr. had had a beautiful black and white stallion named Steltfella that had sired some wonderful foals before he was sold. Horses, for me, were a healthy outlet. At a time when... Teenagers were struggling to find their identity and turn to all of the demonic vices that Satan has to distract them from what the Lord has for them. The Lord had his hand on me and gave me a passion to strive towards. After my grandpa's stallion sold, my parents were looking for 
looking to breed several of his nice mares to some good stallions. When my parents found the stallion they wanted to breed to, breed their mares to, they came home refreshed and excited to tell everyone they knew about this beautiful black American quarter horse by the name of Freckles Can Do. I couldn't wait to see this stallion in person. We drove up to Bitterroot, and I'll never forget my heart rate accelerated when I saw him. He was short and compact with a beautiful muscle structure, yet eloquent in his movement. He had a beautiful white square mark on his forehead, and if my memory serves me correct, maybe a white stocking or two, but the rest of him was jet black, and I was so excited to get a foal by this beautiful black stallion. A year later, the Lord blessed me with a beautiful black stud. Praise God. That's exactly what I wanted. Almost a mere image of what Freckles Can Do looked like. I wanted to learn everything there was to learn about what a rain horse was, how to train them, how to ride better, all of it. I was obsessed with the newfound passion that the Lord had brought into my life. I bought all the horse training videos I could get my hands on, went to a few horse training clinics. I wanted to follow this passion all the way through. When you're young and are not confident in what you're good at, but have a passion for it, it's important to find out what your strengths and weaknesses are so you can concentrate on your strengths and not waste time with something you're not, you're not going to be successful at. After I graduated high school, I went to North Carolina to work with a hungry young trainer who had had some success in the rain horse business named Brian. He was, gift, he was a gifted tra- horse trainer with a deep southern drawl. Anybody remember uh, North Carolina accents? Yeah, I, I love their accents in North Carolina. It's probably one of the coolest southern accents I'd re- I've run across. And they're very charming as well, I should say. He was a, so my mother had told me that I was, if I was going to go to North Carolina for the summer, that I needed to be all in. No matter how hard it may be, I agreed that I would finish the summer, summer there. So young people here today, this is important. It is critical that if you make a commitment to someone, that you follow through with that commitment. If you do not mean what you say and say what you mean, your word is worthless. Scripture says in James 5.12, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath under any other oath, but yet your yes be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. So I made my way down to North Carolina. Little did I know, God knew, but I didn't, that North Carolina is the Bible Belt. I was, I was working every day except I had some Sundays off. But it was during this time that I grew a hunger for the Word of God. I was living in a trailer park and had met a wonderful mechanic who had... Uh, We joyfully agreed to go. I went to breakfast with this man and his wife and his pastor. His pastor was on fire. He had a zeal and was ready to preach. I felt his, the presence of God in him and was hungry for what, he, what the Lord had put on his heart. He had this seasoning in his speech that made my soul hungry to hear what he had to say. When I heard this man preach, I saw his passion for the word of God and was instantly drawn in. He exposes the word of God clearly and concisely, but also with passion and a gentle spirit. I was perplexed. Why had I not seen preachers like this in Montana? It was another crossroad in my journey of faith. The Lord was building my faith by placing godly influences around me. After that summer of growth, I was wanting to become a horse trainer. My parents were concerned I would not make much money at it. And it was dangerous work. So they wanted me to get a college degree as a backup plan. I agreed to their terms. I love learning new things anyway. So going to school was another adventure. Also, at that time, I was interested in dating college girls. Like many of you young age 
young age men out there. I was 19 and full of testosterone. I had it planned out. I was going to go, go to college, get a degree, have a great time, and get a degree in something easy like business management or something that just gives me a degree. I never gave any thought to what the Lord had, Lord wanted me to do or what my calling in life may be. When I began college, my college career at the University of Montana, I was challenged on many fronts by secular ideology. I was exposed to many left-leaning ideologies that pushed up against my Christian core values. It was during that time that I began to realize that people, that many people thought different than me. Have any of you gone to, who have gone to college bumped into this phenomenon? Anybody? Yeah. So I'm not alone here. That's good. I had been distracted by my worldly lust of chasing women and dreaming about graduation. But things were not going my way. The young woman I was pursuing was not a Christian. She did not think like I thought and had many different core values than me. I could not understand why she didn't think like me. Anybody else run into that? <laughs> and I'm sure she had the same frustration. So I decided, this, I decided to stop pursuing this young woman. It was heartbreaking to me that my relationship with her was not going the way I wanted it to. But I'm glad God had different plans for me. I was seeing the same theme every time I dated a non-believer. I was so frustrated and thought, is there something wrong with me? Right when I was about to give up on dating during my junior year in college, I went with, a couple, with my college friends out to a salsa dance at this time. I was not caring if I met a girl or not. I had learned about liberal ideology in college and was not expecting much at all from college girls. I was sitting there at this club and I saw this hippie girl dancing with all her friends. She was, she was the life of the party. The other girls were not wanting to dance and she was like, get out here and dance. You know, get out here and let's move. Let's do it. I remember thinking how interesting. She looks fun and the other girls look like bumps on a log. I was thinking, look at that hippie chick. Now, some of you here today may have been hippies or known hippies in the 60s and 70s. Well, this was a throwback hippie. <laughs> then I heard something within my spirit say, Sam, I want you to go ask that girl to dance. I was like, no, that's a hippie chick. I don't, I don't hang out with hippies. But I decided to listen to that voice and ask her to dance. I walked, I walked up to her and told her, I want to dance with you. She looked at me for a few seconds and decided it was okay for me to dance with her. She had to test me to see if I knew what I was doing, so she told me to dip her. <laughs> I remember thinking, okay, I've taken, a I've taken enough dance classes in college, I can do that. So I did, and then I began to speak to her and found out that she was a horse-crazy horse girl who was just who was in her master's program planning on going to the Peace Corps. She was fascinating to me because I'd never met a young woman secure in who they were and what they were going to do, who also seemed to have the same interests as me. She uh, immediately told me she didn't want a relationship. I, I was a little bummed by that. I remember thinking, in a way, this is kind of bad news, but... It's refreshing. I didn't go through three dates and spend a bunch of money before I knew whether she was worth pursuing. <laughs> so I decided that since she was open and honest with me, that she was worth being friends with. Also, she was much smarter and prettier than most of the other girls I had pursued. So I decided I would ask her to go horseback riding with me. Of course, she said yes. What horse lover would say no to such a proposal? I took her ride not just once but several times. We had great, a great time, and the conversation with her was amazing. She was well-versed on many subjects. The Lord allowed me to build a great friendship with her, and I was okay with that. 
because I knew she was leaving. I had to, I had to guess, if I had to guess, I would say that she was, she was young in her walk with Christ, but I do believe that she was a Christ follower. I believe the Lord sent her to help me understand myself more and also to bless her as well. My 23rd year was one of the best years of my life. I had found a friend who, had, who was a light for me during a dark and consuming time in my life. The time had come for her to leave for the Peace Corps, and I was bummed out about it because I had met, I had met a great girl, and why, and why would I meet a great girl like her just for them to leave after a short time. There came a time during my senior year in college, I was 24 and I was almost to the end. I had switched majors from business management to communication studies. I wanted to know how to communicate well with people. I had found that few people really understood me, but also I really didn't understand a lot of people. I never thought, oh, I need to first seek to understand others before they seek to understand me. How many people have been there? I was missing my friend who did understand me. I was thinking to myself, she was such a light in my life, and now she is gone. I remember being at a major crossroads in my life. I was in my room wondering, what am I going to do with myself? I can go to the bars and hang out with my college buddies who may or may not be comforting to me. Maybe try and meet another girl, but that had been fruitless most of the time since most girls in Missoula were not Christians that I was meeting. Or I could do the hard work of reading my Bible, which I hadn't done in years. I I didn't even really know how to study it, and that was disheartening. However, what does Scripture say? James 4, 8, if you draw near to God, he will what? draw near to you. I prayed and asked God to please show me what I needed. The Lord was faithful to provide for me. I recalled in a sermon where I had heard that if you are a new believer or a baby Christian, to start reading in the book of John. And so I opened up my Bible to the book of John, and it was already on chapter 9. I began to read from verse 1 until the Holy Spirit stopped me on verse 5. This is what John 9, 5 says. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I was thinking, man, wasn't I just thinking about light a few minutes ago? You know, when I was thinking somebody else was a light. That verse hit me like a wave of the ocean. It put me in a blissful state because I had been looking for a light to replace the light that had left me. And Jesus was the answer all along. Soon after I had read that, I felt the scripture speak to me and say, Sam, I will be that light for you, but you have to do your part. After that, I made a commitment to no longer be a man that was half in the world and half in my relationship with Christ. A couple months before graduation, I remember having a conversation that was a uh, cornerstone to my direction in life. I was speaking with one of the best horse trainers in the nation, and I asked him how he was doing. He told me he was at a horse show. I said, well, are you excited to show one of your best horses? I'll never forget what he said. He said, Sam, I know you're excited about getting involved in this business, but for me, it's just another horse show. I wondered why someone who had been so successful in the horse business would say something like that. During that time, during the same month, one of my favorite professors told me something very similar. I had asked him how he was going to test us, and he said, Sam, this test may be challenging for you, but for me, it's just another test. The second time I heard this, I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me something important. Soon after I graduated, I took up a horse training apprenticeship in Texas, and what was supposed to be my dream job soon lost its savor. I was working with one of the best breeders and trainers in the country. I found out that I I found out that after about a month, that this was not for me, and it was it was time to move on. 
I was at another crossroad of uncertainty about what I was going to do with my life. The horse passion turned out to be a dead end. I moved back to Missoula looking for a nine to five job. I was never, it was a new experience, but I ended up getting a job at the DirecTV call center, now the AT&T call center. But I was beginning to make money and I was looking for a church with sound Bible teaching. When I was 26, I met a man named Pete at a Bible study and he had been through some crossroads of his own with his health. He was interested in investing in the young men and he invited me to a men's Bible study in, in, in town. I was concerned about what... I was the youngest man there. Most of the men had much more life experience than me and were concerned about what they had been witnessing in the churches. But these men were problem solvers. I was spiritually starving at that point in my life and needed guidance. The Lord had brought these seasoned men into my life at just the right time. One of the men in the Bible study by the name of T took a genuine interest in me and agreed to meet with me and help me in finding the identity, my identity in Christ. He recommended a book called Victory Over the Darkness by Neil Anderson. This book deeply impacted my life. Dr. Anderson used scripture to exposit the word of, a God, word of God in a way I hadn't done, heard before and demonstrate the identity we as believers have in Christ. Have in Christ. Yeah. The time I spent with T was a wonderful time of fellowship and spiritual development, and I was searching for my identity in Christ. I had visited some churches in Missoula and found a lot of people, a lot of churches that were good at encouraging and, and entertaining people, but not good at preaching and teaching the Word of God. I soon settled on one of the churches in Missoula that was one of the more biblically sound churches. When I met another Christian man by the name of Wayne, I had shared with him my frustration in the dating world when he shared this verse with me. This is important. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? When I read that verse, opened my eyes to why I had so much confusion when dating secular women. No wonder was I not having success. These women were not believers. That was a major breakthrough for me, and I wished I had known that before I ever decided to court women in the first place. I was growing in Bible knowledge and getting spiritually fed there. However, I was sensing that this church was not my home church. In 2016, I was 31 years old. The Lord moved me out of the, that church. I had found some newfound brothers I had met through my, through a, at a Bible study T had uh, invited me to. Dave, who had taught me how to search out the Bible for insights. Also, Bob and Kellen, who told me about Bible Study Fellowship. And I was excited to be meeting more men to fellowship with. It was here that I met a man who had another deep impact on my life. Many of you know him or had known him or have known him, Rick Van Pelt. Rick was an answer to prayer for me. He was interesting to listen to and had that light of Jesus about him that easily draws people to him. He was also interested in developing young men spiritually. He was the one that told me about Crosspoint and got me involved in life groups. Pastor Bruce and I met, and he mentioned to me that I needed to go through discipleship training. I told him, I think I'm a spiritually mature Christian. He kind of laughed at me, and he replied, Okay, do you, do you know how to disciple someone else? And I said, No, not really. <laughs> he said, Then it's a good idea to go through discipleship. So Rick walked me through the discipleship program, and I matured in going through it. Rick also hosted the Truth Project in his home with his wife, Kathy. I was going through a wonderful growth period in my life, and Rick was such a light to be around. Sadly, Rick went home to be with the Lord last year, but he labored for the Lord until the end and has left many great memories and impacts on other people's lives. 
Pastor Bruce and I had spoken about going to seminary while Rick was still alive. And I was wondering what I was going to do with the rest of my life. I wanted purpose and satisfaction like many of you. And I was tired of working for a corporation and not producing any spiritual fruit for the, for the kingdom of heaven. It, it was time for me to step out in faith and quit chasing dead ends. <clears throat> in closing, the Lord put these verses on my heart to speak to you today. Colossians 4, 4 through 6. Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Speaking today to those in their 60s and older, <clears throat> there are many young people like me who are looking for seasoned men and women of God to speak into their lives and help them find out what is their calling in life, like Rick Van Pelt did for me. Salt is good for two things, to preserve food and to make food taste good. The Word of God is similar in that we are to make our speech preserve life and to be edifying to those we speak to. When I was in seminary, I was... Uh, exposed to lots of different preaching, and I heard really good preaching and not so good preaching. Um, so, and obviously, this is my first time, so, you know, uh, you guys make the decision today. However, I noticed that most of the good speakers had purpose behind their speech. So, it was seasoned, so you, it was like eating a great meal that you would want to just devour. And then it was edifying at the same time, so it made you, you were able to taste it and eat it, but it also made you feel good at the same time, and it also produced fruit. I told myself I want to be one of those kinds of men. In tying all these together, I wanted to show three crossroads that the Lord has led me through. Crossroad number one, finding eternal security. Crossroad number two, being all in with my faith in Jesus. And crossroad number three, finding out what the Lord's call is. Today, Maybe you are at a crossroads in your life to make a decision to follow Jesus. Or maybe you're at a crossroad where the Lord is asking, what are you doing with your life? If that is you today, please see Pastor Bruce or myself or any of the other pastors here. Remember what Scripture said in James. If you draw near to God, he will what? Thank you. <laughs>